You're listening to Win Win, an entrepreneurial community with your host, Ben Wolf. And welcome to the Win Win Podcast. This is your host, Ben Wolf, as always. Uh, we're going to discuss a very interesting and unorthodox topic today, which is psychedelics and the entrepreneur. Uh, and as we get into talking about this, I want to first uh, introduce our guest today. He is an executive coach and HR management consultant through his company, 40 Pillars. Uh, in that role, he has worked with leaders of various companies, including Microsoft, Boeing, the Navy SEALs, AT&T, Deloitte, Wells Fargo, Fidelity, and Google. You can learn more more about him at 40pillars.com. It's the number 440pillars.com. And with that, I give you Joe Cohen. Welcome, Joe. Hey, Ben. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Great to have you. Thanks for uh, making the time for this. And I guess if we could start us off like I do with all guests here, to if you could please give, give our guests here a quick like a two-minute background some context to understand like where you came from, where, where you know, how you got to be doing what you're doing today, and especially as it uh, as it might give context to the interesting topic today. Wow, I still haven't mastered uh, that elevator pitch. So two-minute background, I would say I, I graduated college in 2005, uh, worked for probably about 10 or 12 years in corporate and different organizations, eventually went to law school, graduated, but I knew in law school that I did not want to be a lawyer. And I started doing courses. The smart, become a very coach. smart as a, <laughs> as a former practicing attorney, very smart. So I got my, I got my certifications uh, in the coaching world, eventually became an instructor at a coaching school and I, I was helping people and uh, I felt it was, it was one of my passions. I loved uh, working with small organizations and leaders to help them actualize their potential. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Nice. Well, uh, so let me get in. I want to, I want to share a quote that I know we've talked about uh, with each other offline uh, that I think might set up the conversation. Tony Robbins uh, has said that success is 80% psychology and 20% mechanics. He said, what you do doesn't matter if you aren't in the right mindset, understanding the way psychology can work for or against you, will help you establish a healthier outlook and put you in the right mindset to execute your strategy. So maybe with that like background, uh, what the heck does do psychedelics have to do with entrepreneurship? Okay, well, you know, Tony's quote uh, that 80% of success is psychology um, just makes me think of that we all have a blueprint, right? And our our blueprint sometimes at, um, has inherent limitations. Our unconscious mind, which runs 95% of our operating system, impacts our decisions. It impacts our emotions. So if we have um, inner conflicts around our, our, our thinking, if we don't believe that we're enough, if we don't love ourselves, if we... Um, have a lot of fears in life, then that's going to affect how we implement the strategy. You can have the best strategy in the world and a strategy can save you 10 years. I'm a strategist. However, um, knowledge is not power, right? It's, it's potential power, knowledge. So implementation, action is what's most important. And it's our emotions that influence our behaviors. And our behaviors, obviously, is what impacts how we implement the strategy. So so how does all of that connect to this concept of psychedelics? So, so psychedelics um, is will help you for some people. I don't endorse it for everyone. I could tell you how it's worked for me and has helped the, some of the clients that I've worked with. Would that be okay? Yeah, yeah, I would love I would love to because it's just something that you know, it's just gotten more out there into the public conversation recently. I've seen TED Talks about it, TED MD talks about it. I've heard Joe Rogan talking about it. Like, you know, you, you just hear more and more conversation 
uh, more and more conversation about it. Obviously, this podcast is related to business and like, you know, business ownership. So, um, so, you know, obviously, you know, if, if it can, I mean, you, you make a great context point, which is that, you know, everything you do, the way you treat people, the way you treat your team, the way you act in your business, the confidence or lack thereof, or belief in yourself or your business that you have is all based on what's going on in your head, the narrative or script that you uh, compare, I guess, the outside world against. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be, it would be helpful to like, say like, how did how did you get to be thinking about psychedelics or what, what place have, have they had, I guess, in your personal and entrepreneurial sort of journey in life? Sure. Um, so I was introduced to psychedelics about two years ago. I never did it in a recreation way growing up. Um, I was in therapy for a few years for some PTSD that I experienced from childhood trauma. I had a very interesting journey growing up and I, I realized that I kind of hit a plateau. In and therapy. just for, for those listening, I've talked a little bit with Joe, not a lot. I mean, this is, he is highly understating what, what, you know, you know, everybody has their own story, but Joe is like highly understating the severity of what, he went through as a child. I'm just putting that out there. Like we don't need to get into all the details. You actually have talked about it in another podcast a little bit more, but um, you know, but, yeah. uh, but just to be, you know, this is not like, uh, I don't know. I, you know, I didn't get a participation trophy, you know, in, uh, in third grade. All right. <laughs> you know, this is, this is serious stuff. No, I, I'll give a two minute nutshell of, of high level stuff. Um, I was born during the Iranian revolution. I was born in Iran. And my father was killed when I was a baby and my mom and I had to escape Iran. Uh, she remarried someone who was from the South, the M Mississippi. And uh, I was, for the first part of my childhood, I lived in the South and I experienced a lot of um, racism. I uh, was picked on sent away at a very young age. So there was abandonment issues. Uh, I was sent to military school for a few years. I was jumped in gangs at an early age. Uh, eventually mm -hmm. found myself incarcerated at 17 for about seven seven months. Um, I go really deep into my story on the Ellie Nash podcast. So if someone wanted to hear a more in-depth version of mm -hmm. my story, I guess we could put the link in the show notes. Sure. Uh, but I, I've been functioning okay. I mean, I have people like me. I have friends. I went to college. I went to law school. I've had great jobs. I've helped hundreds of people. But I knew there was something deeper inside. I knew that I wasn't actualizing my potential. I wasn't proud of how I felt sometimes, how I reacted to things. And I knew, I felt like there was like this upper limit that I was self-sabotaging in ways. Mm -hmm. So one day, one, one time I was in a workshop and I had this somatic type experience where I was, um, I just had this healing experience through breath work. And from there, I realized- What does the word that, somatic mean? Uh, the, the body, healing, okay. like therapy with the body. And I'm mm -hmm. not an expert in any of this stuff. No, I just didn't. I just don't know the word. <laughs> so really, I guess you can heal in ways through breath work, through meditation. There are psychedelics that, that could actually help you have a somatic healing. And I had a great experience where I released a lot of emotions for the first time in over 25 years. And that never happened in one-on-one -on -one talk therapy. And I realized from that that I was in therapy, which is great. It's helpful, but I was communicating at the, you know, from a cerebral intellectual. Right. Superficial. Superficial way. I wasn't connected to my emotions. I wasn't connected to my body, my heart. So when I had that session in breath work, I was able to release some emotions. And it 
led me to think what what else is possible how much am i uh repressing how much have i repressed <clears throat> and there's dozens of books out there gabor mate has a book uh peter levine not peter levine i don't know the, the person's name but there are many people that have written books on how the, the body keeps a score on how our emotions impact mm -hmm. how we show up in the world so i i'm always looking to improve and i um don't see myself as a victim i'm the creator of my life so i wanted to use whatever tools are out there to help me be a better version of myself so that led me to psychedelics and had a great experience where with with one particular psychedelic and i cried for like 10 15 minutes mm. i'm like wow i didn't know this was there how is this impacting me <laughs> how how are these repressed emotions how have they impacted me in the past so um i felt so much better and i felt like 10 pounds of emotional weight was dropped after i had mm. that experience and then from there over the last two years, I've had other experiences, which have been transformational for me. Um, and how do you? How have you found that those things have changed or affected you in terms of, or maybe in the way that those things maybe were previously affecting how you showed up and how you did in business and and uh, in entrepreneurship, or uh, or I guess or or the converse of after you started doing some of that work. How did that, you know, affect you or your, 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 your business afterwards? I, one of the things I experienced with the, the plant medicine ayahuasca, what it revealed to me is that I had these hidden parts of myself that showed me that I didn't have enough love for myself. And I looked at myself in a very critical way that I was not aware of. I was never aware of this. It never came up in therapies. I've worked with many coaches and never came up. So that revealed to me that, wow, I got this far in life and there's so much more I want to do with thinking myself in such a critical way and really not loving myself as much as I should. And there are many other things that came up um, in that I'm like, what else is possible? And that revealed to me that I need to do work in that area. So after I had that experience, it brought more self-awareness on those different areas that I need to focus on. And once I focused on that, brought more self-awareness to it, I would call it the integration process. So you, you experience the psychedelics and then there's a integration process. And that is just as important as working with the medicine. And integration is how are you integrating the insights you learn into your life? So, so how, did, how did you find that that affected or, or made you be different or show up different or, or do different things, I guess, you know, I guess both personally and in your business? I think one of the most important areas is uh, less of a need for validation. So, so what I, was that previous need for more validation? What was that? What was that doing to you? Or, or what was that making happen? So, for example, I think what led me to law school is not because I loved the law. I didn't. I did not <laughs> love arguing in court or writing, you know, contracts or reviewing and researching, you know, long, long cases. What led me to that is the thought that, you know what, I need this credential because it will uh, people it will give me validation. I'll show people, look what I have. I have a JD. I went for cert certain certifications in my past because I need to have that shingle, hang that shingle up. Look what I got. So meaning it's, as it, a, as a person or a business owner, how many in, in your in your type of example, like how many projects have I done? How many? things have I pursued for some fake reason, right? That's really not leading me toward where I want to be. How much time and energy am I wasting because of some 
false narrative in my head rather than because it's actually what I want to do where it's taking me where I want to go. 100%. Uh, and I have a good example of that. Um, I worked with a client about six months ago who uh, was a CEO. He is the CEO of a, a tech company of about 50 employees. And they actually brought me in to do some HR consulting, but that evolved into me being his executive coach. And one of the things that I learned with working with him and through doing some emotional intelligence testing is that he had this need to be involved with all the projects to be seen. He wanted to, to be in the action. And, he, and that kind of upset a lot of his direct reports. And he was micromanaging them because he wanted to be involved. He wanted to be seen. He wanted his voice to be heard. Um, so that's how it showed up there for that client. So what was behind that? That need what to like that need for micromanagement or always being involved or always being heard is what was behind that. He had this, something was missing inside. He felt he had his own stuff that was not worked out. It was not processed uh, related to uh, not feeling love, not being seen, heard, and understood, I guess, in his childhood from his parents. Mm -hmm. um, he was dealing with a lot of anxiety, and I think that also played a role where he had to he had so much anxiety about the projects he had to micromanage everything and then like i guess how did besides you know the, the act of micromanaging or just the, the actual feeling of anxiety like what like how did that negatively affect his business or his team or his people yeah he he lost two of his key people his attrition rate was pretty high and as you know uh, that costs companies a lot of money. Uh, there are some studies that show that when you lose an employee, that's you're, you're paying at least 50% of their salary to replace them. And then there's a loss of productivity costs when someone leaves your company. Uh, there's a recruiting cost. There's, it takes time to find someone to onboard them, make sure they're the right culture fit. So he lost some really good people because he just wasn't he wasn't present with them he couldn't receive feedback he micromanaged them mm -hmm. and i actually spoke to these employees before they left mm -hmm. so that's how it in fact uh, affected his business so what happened i guess where did psychedelics play a role and and in, in 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 turning things around and and, and then what happened so so I, you know, there's a fine line with coaching and therapy and I don't play the role as a therapist. Sometimes yeah. my clients call me their business therapist, but I, I really always out, I refer them out to, to a great therapist and in therapy, he got a little bit of help, but the therapist realized that because the therapist was open to working with psychedelics, the therapist referred uh, suggested that he works with mushrooms, psilocybin. So the therapist actually administered the mushrooms and they had a experience. He had a great experience with the therapist and uh, he, he learned a lot about himself. So what difference did that make or like what happened after that? He, it brought more self-awareness to him on where, how his, I guess, ch own childhood trauma, I'm not sure if you want to call it trauma, but childhood experiences was a affecting him today and how he, it helped him improve his empathy and compassion for others. So that eventually led to more employee engagement and improved the culture. He was also, with with my help, 
we did a 360 feedback assessment and uh, he was more receptive to feedback. And I also worked with him on creating psychological safety in the culture and the organization. So he would actively kind of, he would be very vulnerable and criticize himself to show how he made mistakes. I would call it extreme ownership, you know, mm -hmm. as Jocko, Will Jocko Williams talks about. Yeah. And then by the employee seeing him do that, they felt more comfortable giving him feedback and it created a more just a comfortable culture. Right. So it's, it's truly inseparable. The role that like your psychology and your mindset is as a, as a business owner or as, or as a leader, uh, you know, and how you do business, it's not, you know, it, it, it affects everything. I mean, it affects 50 people's lives in the case of your story of this person's example affects 50 people's lives and uh, and the success and speed of progress in his business. I worked with, yes, 100%. I worked with a, a partner at a mid-sized law firm. I, I guess they had about two or 300 employees. And this partner had an alcohol problem. And as you know, I think the ABA shows that the American Bar Association shows that 20% of lawyers have an alcohol problem. Did not know that. Good thing I left the law. Good thing. Got, got out just in time. <laughs> yes, good thing. So <laughs> it's it's a it's a big issue. Okay. And uh, one of the partners brought me in to work with him. And he wasn't really receptive to working with me in the beginning. He had a big ego and he wasn't coachable, but we did some work together. And he realized that his job, his role was on the line. So thankfully, over time, he was open to exploring other ways to um, work on himself. Eventually, he started working with mushrooms, and that helped him scale back drastically from alcohol. And mm. I could say now he's, he's, he's been sober for about six months. Mm. Wow. Wow. Um, and he doesn't have he doesn't have a desire anymore to drink. And there is a lot of underlying things that was leading to him having a desire to drink. Right. It reminds me of that uh, that study with the rats that the ones that were just in an empty cage, they would get addicted to this heroin or whatever it was, mm -hmm. laced water. You know, they would just do it all the time. But the rats that were in this like a rat topia or whatever, where there's like tons of other rats and, you know, lots of things to engage with. And they were just in sort of like a rat heaven. <laughs> and, and when they had a heroin water and regular water that they didn't go for the heroin water. Wow. Um, because there was, you know, there was not that gap in, in, in their existence or whatever that they're filling. Cause I mean, that addiction is filling some gap. Uh, and so I, I guess what you're saying about this partner, not that we're humans are like rats, but in some ways we are, but what you're <laughs> saying about that partner is that, you know, when he didn't have as much of a gap and he was felt more whole, he was able to, uh, not do things that were destroying his life that filled that gap. A hundred percent. Yeah. And there, I mean, there's dozens of studies to show how psychedelics, are used for therapeutic purposes and how they have healed people in many different ways from heroin addictions, other types of addictions. Um, I, I think it's, it's definitely worth looking into and, and speaking for someone to speak to their doctor and their therapist to see if it makes sense for them. Right. Well, let me ask you this a final question because we kind of got dove straight into the topic without even talking about like what even are psychedelics like or why would they have an impact of helping i don't know process uh, trauma or open a person up be more emotionally healthy um not asking you from a scientific perspective because i understand you're not a doctor but right. um but, but asking just from a human perspective or from like your understanding of it what are psychedelics? What happens when someone does them? 
I'm just very, very high level or just super basic, very high level. but like, okay. What, how does it feel? What happens when you're on them? And why would there be any connection between that and I don't know, letting go of trauma or, you know, becoming more open and less egotistical? Yes. I like that word less egotistical. So I'll, so on a high level, psychedelics are hallucinogens and they're a type of drug that changes a person's perception of reality. And it really is like an ego dissolution experience. When I worked with psychedelics, things that would trigger me would definitely not trigger me when I was working with the psychedelics. It, it, it lessened my ego. It's like my ego dissolved. And I felt more joy, more peace, more love, just more connected to people. I felt more empathy and compassion for people, felt more empathy and compassion for myself. And you really can't love others until you love yourself. So think like connecting it back to being an entrepreneur. If you're a leader, if you have a business, you're a leader. You either leave yourself. That's the inside, inside out game, which is, it always starts with yourself and you're leading <clears> others. <throat> so smaller your ego is, you're going to be more receptive to feedback. Smaller your ego is, you're going to be more compassionate, more empathetic, hopefully. Obviously, it's not, a, it's not a magic pill. It opens you up. It creates self-awareness for that time. And then you have to integrate and, and bring self-awareness around it. I like to say what you're aware of, you're in control of. What you're not aware of is in control of you. So self-awareness is the most important domain under emotional intelligence. Because it it all starts with that. When you, an alcoholic, for him to go into recovery, he has to say, hey, I'm an alcoholic. My name is Joe. I'm an alcoholic. So it starts with the self-awareness. If someone realizes like, hey, I'm not uh, compassionate enough to my employees, what exercises can I do? Let me work with a therapist. Let me work with a coach to work on compassion. Let me bring self-awareness. How can I have more compassion for myself? A lot of times people are, I have a client that I, that I worked with who is so critical of himself. And just this, through our work together, I discovered that his mother criticized him a lot. Things were never good enough. And that was still following him today. And it mm -hmm. impacts how he manages his employees. And his employees didn't like working with him. So they're 50% engaged. That's a loss of productivity. Mm -hmm. They have one foot out the door. Mm -hmm. There's no loyalty. And it's just not a great place to, to, to work in. So thankfully, he was coachable and he was open to that. And with the help of psychedelics, he was able to, to start increasing the compassion that he had for himself. Hmm. How do, so one last question. I think I said last question last time, but one last question. How do the realizations or the lack of ego or whatever happens during those psychedelic experiences, how does that, why doesn't that just end when the experience ends? Meaning how does that translate into more awareness or less ego or integrating those realizations or whatever that you have during the experience how does that how, how does that like continue to affect like why why does that help or how does that help after the experience is over because it only lasts a few hours right so it, it only that, lasts that continue afterwards yeah great question because you have insights during your journey and it's important to record them keep a journal it's, you're you're more open the day after the mm -hmm. maybe two or three days after after so to just you got to put yourself in the right setting you don't want to jump right back into the office but if you could put yourself in nature put yourself in a setting where there's more quiet more peace and just be with your thoughts you know most people have a hard time just being with themselves 
just sitting with themselves. I used to be that guy. Um, I didn't need, I didn't have a need to be around people, but I had a need to always listen to something. I would call myself a podcast junkie. Never been addicted to drugs, never been addicted to alcohol, but I, I, I had other addictions like, okay, what's the next book I can download? Next audio book, next podcast, whatever it is. I was constantly distracting myself. And there's a place for knowledge to learn, but there's also a place to reflect and just be with yourself and to think, why do I behave this way? Why, why do I have a, I have a client who had a fear of putting himself out there on LinkedIn? Why? Because how people are going to perceive me. I have anxiety around that. I have everything has to be done in a perfect way. So if you if you're worried out people are going to perceive you so much, you're really limiting yourself because you're not going to put yourself out there. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, thankfully, you've had over I don't know how many podcast interviews, 50. You I'm I'm very impressed with how many I think it's over 130 something. Over 130 mm -hmm. interviews. You get something. a lot done. I'm I'm very impressed with your transition out of, out of law into building up your consulting business and running this podcast. It's it's pretty incredible. Um but if you were so concerned about how other people perceived you, it would be very challenging for you to put yourself out there mm -hmm. on YouTube and have these interviews. Right. But this person dealt with that. So I think with with increased confidence, um, you in less of a need for for validation, you you're you're more likely to put yourself out there and take more action. Right. I appreciate it. So if someone wants to know more and you know maybe think thinks that this might be something that's worth exploring for them or learning more about, uh, wh wh where should they go? Where should they look? I'm not the the expert in psychedelics, so I I would say you know there's a good documentary on Netflix called How to Change Your Mind okay. by Michael Pollan, and then there's just so much on the internet that that you know people can find out resources there. Uh, in terms of coaching, uh, fractional HR consulting or executive and business coaching, people can reach out to me. And that's through my website, 40pillars.com. Awesome. I really appreciate it, Joe. Thank you for making the time for this conversation. Very interesting. And like I said, an unorthodox topic for this uh, for this podcast. But I, I think that I, I asked you to speak about it because, you know, it is for business owners. And there's all kinds of things that affect people's business and people's entrepreneurial journey. Um, and if you ignore the 80%, you know, if you ignore the mindset, um, then all the strategy and, you know, tools and tactics in the world are not going to make things truly different for you. So I want to explore this topic. So thank you so much for, for doing this. I appreciate it. My pleasure. It was great hanging out with you. Thank you so much. And everybody else, we will see you on the other side. Thanks. You're listening to Win Win, an entrepreneurial community with your host, Ben Wolf.